Okay, we're gonna get started with um, Dr. Cohen. I don't wanna take any more of her time. Um, I have had such a great time the last two days getting to know you and um, learn about where you're from and how you're implementing coaching. Thank you so much for, a, I think, a really good memory and uh, some really good energy to take into the future to continue to, to do the coaching work. Um, Dr. Cohen, I think, is going to leave us all on a really, really more energized place. Um, she is, I have her bio and I'll read some of the specifics for you, uh, but the most important thing um, to us is how much she is uh, loved and treasured here with the UC Davis Extension. She teaches a lot of classes for us um, and we are so grateful that she's here locally and can do that. She trains all over the nation um, and she speaks our language. She really, her specialty is working with, um, she'll tell you more, but really working with um, folks who have, have undergone trauma and how you, um, how you work with people, who work with people who go through trauma. Um, she's an organizational and clinical psychologist. Uh, she's facilitated management and staff trainings. She's a national speaker. Uh, professional threat assessor, trauma and violence prevention expert. Uh, she also works extensively with primary and secondary trauma resulting from, from violence and tragic incidents. Um, we are so happy that she's here. Let's give her a warm, warm welcome. Hello. Let me see if it's working. Come on. Hello, am I on? Yes, hi. How was the last couple days? <laughs> amazing, huh? I just came on the scene today, but oh my goodness, it's been amazing. So, um, so I'm so happy that actually, I'm actually happy that I'm kind of rounding this last part of the day because how many of you found that some of the, some of the classes and some of the, the, the trainers have been really, really informative about sort of new ways of coaching, new, new modalities, new thoughts about how it is that your, either your agencies could benefit or you as a coach could benefit. Anybody finding that? So what I'm gonna do now for our end of our day is actually talk to you about why you wanna do this. Because I am, I'm both by trade a clinical and organizational psychologist, but most of my postgraduate studies have been in the neurosciences. So I'm gonna talk to you about why it is that we need to, at HSAs, why it is at HSAs that we need to make a commitment to change culture and to take care of our employees differently, to work the more, the more we take care of our employees, the more we're able to operate in a healthier work environments, the more our customer and our clients are gonna be better. Would that be an agreement? Yeah. Right, it's so connected in this work. Unlike if you were maybe building cars or making chocolates, this work requires all of that to make it work. So let's talk a little bit about, um, about the neurosciences. Introduction to social neuroscience I'm gonna to talk to you about. Uh, we're gonna talk about how is it that we optimize learning and we're able to maximize min and minimize threat. So we're gonna talk about threat versus reward today and how the brain operates in terms of that. We're also gonna talk about the SCARF model. Um, I am part of the Neuroleadership Institute. The Neuroleadership Institute does research all over the world, mostly in academic places and in, in, in academia. And what we have now know is why it is in terms of how the brain responds to certain aspects of our interpersonal relationships and our work relationships. So we'll have a chance to talk about that. And we're gonna also talk about coaching strategies to optimize growth and to, op to optimize creating what I like in my business to call transformational change. So I am a trauma expert, and, and Nancy was saying that. And I, I go across the country and I talk about secondary trauma, I talk about primary trauma. And the piece that I know is that when you're working in industries where not only are our clients and customers mostly coming in traumatized and in crisis, right? I've never met anybody that comes and saying, wow, my life is going great, why don't I run over the HSA and talk to somebody? You know, right, they just don't. So I say that because one thing that I know is that we need to be aware of, if we're going to address these issues, we need, our goal needs to be transformational change. I say this to senior leaders across the country continuously, please ask for, for transformational change. And here's the interesting thing, Coaching is one of the most powerful ways. Training will always be powerful, am I correct? But what we're finding is the combination of tr 
training and then coaching, or when there's strategic planning and then there's coaching, the combination we're seeing over and over again in the research is a fantastic combination. So we'll have a chance to talk about that. But I think I'm going to first talk about social neuroscience. Is that OK? I'll apologize now. I never thought I was a geek because I was always like really athletic when I was younger. But I've discovered in my older age I'm a geek. So I apologize. I'm like a science geek. Let me tell you about social neuroscience. Here's what we know. Social neuro, what we know about our brains is this, is that we are all, our brains are intensely social. We want to. We want to have successful social relationships. And that is just how we're wired. We also know that based in our survival, anthropologically in our survival, we have an inherent need to be included. Because for our ancestors, if they weren't included, they got eaten. It's just kind of how it happened, right? So you needed tribes. You needed inclusion in order to stay alive. Our brains work the same way, guys. We still feel the same level of threat as if a tiger is going to eat us if we are feeling not included. And I want you to think about this in terms of the social neuroscience, because as I start to talk about the SCARF model, which was built by David Rock, who is actually one of my professors, when I start to talk about the SCARF model, it will start to make sense to you why it is, why it is, and what happens in terms of some of, these, of, some of your people you work with and some of their behaviors. You'll start to understand why it is that there may be times when you have trouble being creative or thinking clearly. What happens? Let's talk about it. We also know in terms of the research that we now understand in the brain that there are two aspects that tend to get um, ignited in us. One aspect is feeling threat, and another aspect actually is feeling reward. So for example, does anybody, have you ever, anybody ever um, um, gambled in here? Anybody go gambling, right? right? Anybody play slots, slot machines? It has what we call intermittent variable reinforcement. You know how you win 100 and then you lose two? That's why. Because you won the 100, right? And you're sure you're going to win more. Right? That's the slots. So what we know is that the reward response is what, when you're playing slots or you're playing a game in which you're winning, the reward response goes off. And we're going to talk about where in the brain and what happens. We also know this, and think about this in terms of your workplaces, since HSAs are so famous for being, having change. Am I correct? I mean, I think it's your middle names, right? Is change equals threat. It is threatening to people, which immediately will create a level of resistance. So when we start talking about change, let's just think about that in terms of a formula. Think about that as a formula. So let me play you a quick video on what social neuroscience is and how the brain works. Humans are social beings that thrive when working in groups. Throughout history, we have enhanced our chances of survival by collectively sharing things such as resources, knowledge, and workloads. Alternatively, isolation or origin from a group could have decreased our survival chances. As a result, our brain is highly aware of our ongoing social status and possible threats or rewards to this. Today, the workplace is one of the biggest social environments the brain experiences. Our brain is constantly providing us with feedback on our social interactions with others. We need to know when things are working in our favor or when our social situation may be under threat. Our brain interprets our social interactions through the use of neural pathways and chemical messages commonly used for pleasure and pain. For example, when our brain recognizes potential rewards from a social interaction, it releases chemicals along the same neural pathways associated with pleasure, making us feel physically good. When we feel threatened, rejected, or taken advantage of, the same pathways that tell us we are in physical pain are activated. Our brains don't always operate in isolation to one another. We often trigger a threat or reward response to the people around us. We may not even realize we are doing this. So the next time you interact with someone at work, consider what social messages you may be sending and the impact you may be having on their brain. So Sentis is a company that's done some very, very interesting videos. If anybody goes onto YouTube, you can find them. They've actually given me permission to use all of their videos because they know my work. So, um, so they, they've given permission. And they're very, very interesting in terms of, of, of their, um, their work as well as their mission. 
Uh, so I think I can't start really going into deeply into the neurosciences until we still first talk about the science of who works at human services. What personalities, who, what kind of temperaments work at human service? And so what we find over and over again, and I've had the opportunity to train, thou train thousands of, of human service professionals, and we see this over and over again, is usually, and think of yourself for a moment, usually there is some drive to be in service. In other words, it's probably not a coincidence that you chose the place you're working. Because there is some drive to be in service. And many times what happens, and we're seeing this in the research, is that what happens actually in the neurosciences is that there's something called mirror neurons. Mirror neurons are neurons that tend to have um, the type of, uh, what they do is they, they activate this part of our brain. They activate the part of our brain that is very empathic and compassionate. They act also activate that part of our brain that has the ability to perceive other people's feelings, to know what people are feeling. How many of you can walk into a room, you kind of just scan the room a little bit, you can see somebody who you know is in a bad mood or kind of down, right? You kind of, we have learned, we know how to do that. Now, the good news about that is, is that it makes you phenomenal in your work. The bad news about that is you don't turn it off when you're done at work. So it ends up, can become a, quite an exhausting process. But why am I talking about this? I'm talking about it because as, as when you're looking and you're either coaching or, or as an agency you're looking for coaches, you must look for coaches who are aware of understanding what it is that your demographic of professionals are. And the demographic tends to be highly empathic. Highly empathic. So I say that because also there's an ability also to, to, to kind of assess other people's attention, intentions and actions. How many of you can walk in, you kind of just kind of know. Like I can sometimes just even predict what somebody's going to say or do. I've been doing this for so long. So I say that because it's an interesting piece. It's also an interesting, compelling piece why it is that in this work, we don't want to shoot for Band-Aids. We want to shoot for transformation. Because HSA professionals are incredibly sensitive people, much more sensitive than other industries that I work in. So let's look at this in terms of coaching. Um, many people will ask me, you know, when I'm coaching, they'll ask me, well, what are the goals? What are the goals? And, and part for me is that I feel like when I'm walking in somewhere, I'm a change agent. That is my responsibility. Something is obviously not working or you wouldn't have called me or called UC Davis, and I'm coming in to assist you with change. Understanding, though, the brain is that what happens in change? We resist change. People, some people will clearly resist change because it's threatening. The other piece is that my goal, my goal, and I say this to, to, to HSA leadership quite often, is if you're going to build a healthy organization, a thriving organization, right, it's going to take some time. It takes time. What I find is that three to five years when people really, really, leadership really, really wants to create a culture change, I see about three to five years. So here's what we also see in the research. So what we see is that for those who are training, when you add coaching, you actually will create more integrated learning, six times more integrated learning than training alone. Think about this, especially for training that you, that you, that you have for your staff, right? We also see that if somebody is going to do a change, initi initiative changes, we see that there's a significant increase in integration of that information and of willingness when we add the coaching. So again, we see some really positive stuff. But people will ask me why. Well, here's one thing. One thing why is because change equals pain. Video just said it. It hits the same receptors as physical pain. Psychological and emotional pain hit the same exact receptors as, as physical pain. In, in fact, what's really kind of interesting is there's been some research that's shown that if, in fact, you take ibuprofen or aspirin that you would if you had physical pain and you take it, you give it a shot if you're actually emotionally in emotional pain, that there's been some efficacy that we actually see a decrease in pain. It's hitting the same receptors. So we know change is pain. Uh, we know humans resist change, right? And we know that it triggers what we call the threat response. So let's talk about that some. So do you mind if I do a quick neuroscience lesson? Does anybody mind? It's, I, I'll go fast as I can, okay? So this brain, I'm going to help you guys with because this is why, this is why we want to create transformational change. So here's what happens. There are three parts, and this is a very simplistic brain, but we, we use it. It's an old simplified model that is used quite often when we're looking at threat and reward. So there are three parts of our brain. 
This is the first part. It's called the neocortex. Our neocortex is made up of 29% of our brain. Human brain is neocortex. That part of our brain is the part of the brain in which we take in information, we take in knowledge, we synthesize information, we make decisions, we have rational thinking, hopefully, and we are able to actually make decisions based in information that's coming in. It's a rational, logical part of our brain. Does anybody know how big, we have 29%, does anybody know how much percentage dogs have? Anybody want to guess, dogs? We're the most, so you know it's under, under 29. Throw out a guess. Don't be shy. 8, 12. 8, 12. 15. You're like, I'm an auctioneer. Do I hear? No, just kidding. 7%. 7%. Okay, you cat lovers. More or less cat lovers. What do you think? Less. Who said less? Yes, less. Usually they say, of course, more, and they're very, very haughty about it, by the way. Cat lovers are really interesting. It's less. It's 3%. 3%. So what we see is this. This part of the neocortex, remember, is that logical reasoning part. But we have another part of our brain, and that is the limbic system. In fact, we have a specific part right here called the amygdala. The amygdala is that part of our brain that takes in fear and threat, and it's called what we call triggers. It triggers emotional responses, strong emotional responses. It triggers such emotional responses that actually all the oxygen and glucose that's usually hanging out here in the neocortex will run to the limbic system, this red part, and we will not be able to think as clearly. Okay, I have a question for you guys. How many of you, I always hated this, when I, when I, when I was managing um, a department here on campus, I, I learned not to say this. If your boss comes up to you, even though you may love your boss, and they say, can you come into the office and talk to me for a little bit? <laughs> Am I correct? Ooh, right? Like, that's the threat response. It's really a great example, right? Because that's the threat response. It gets triggered like, oh boy, I'm in trouble, right? I always would say to my staff, you know, we, I need to talk to you a little bit. You know, do you mind, like, it's nothing bad, nothing bad? Because their eyes would get wide, and they were all, they were all clinicians, so they would get wide, and then they start to analyze it. You know what I mean? So the limbic system is very interesting because the limbic system itself is also where we store our traumas. We store our traumas right here in a place called the hippocampus. And the brain itself, when, when memories are coming in through the, through the trauma center, through the, through the limbic system, it's a one-trick pony. It's one-stop it's one learning. What I mean by that is that if it's happened once and I had a bad experience with my boss asking me to come into the office, I promise you, every time he or she asks me to come into the office, I'm going to have the same response, even if they prove to me that it's fine. So it's called one trial learning in my business. Well, we also have another part of our brain, and that's called the reptilian part of our brain. It's where we fight, flee, or freeze. Now, what's really interesting about this is that the minute the limbic gets kicked off, we are mobilizing in our autonomic nervous system. Our bodies are getting ready for something bad so that we have to go into survival mode. It's called survival mode. So if we move into this part, let me ask you this question. So the neocortex we know is a rational think thought, right? It's a rational thinker. So if right now a tiger walked in through the door, okay, what's your name in the back? My name's Deirdre. Hi, Deirdre. So Deirdre's in the back, poor thing, because she's probably going to get eaten first. So the tiger's <laughs> going to walk in the back, right? Sorry, Deirdre. Bad placement. So t tiger's going to walk into the back. Now, what are you going to do? Tiger comes in. What are you going to do? You're going to exit, so you're, oh, yeah, so she, yeah, you've already, yes, you've already, slid, but you guys are going to fight for it, right? Deirdre's getting eaten. She's just lost her arm, so what are you guys going to do? So run. Some people are going to scream. Some people are going to, like me, I would freeze, right? So I'm probably going to go right under the table, okay? So we're going to flee. We're going to flee, right? Run us some run. Some of us might fight. Who on here wants to lie and say they're going to fight? I will never know, so you can just say, yeah, sure, I'll fight, right? <laughs> Oh, I'm going to fight. So some of us will fight, try to fight, and some of us will freeze. So I say this because that is, an auto, that, is the, that is how our bodies are wired. So if all of a sudden I said to you, oh, guys, wait a minute. Let's be in our neocortex. There's a tiger coming in. What do you think we ought to do? Do you want to, let's take a consensus. Do you want to all run? Would you like to fight? Right by now, Deirdre's gone, and now we've got three people in the back eating. We are not wired that way, guys. We are wired to take immediate action. That's just how we're built. Right? So, come on.
All right, so let's take a look at this for a moment. But what's the brain's response on threat? The brain's response, actually, you pay a price for it. So here are some of the prices, the costs. There's a cognitive cost. We can't think as clearly. And if you think of some people that you work with who you know can be really, really, really competent, and you know they're going through a hard time at work, like, for example, has anybody, this ever happened to you? Like, I remember once I made a really big error. Like, it was a really big error. And so I remember one of my bosses said to me, you know, try not to make that error again because it really created a problem. Ask me how many times I made that same error. I was like, oh my goodness, I can't make an error, right? I'm in my threat response, which meant that I couldn't think as clearly. So we see this quite often. There's a biochemical price that people pay, and that is, is that we're going to secrete a whole bunch of cortisol, which is, is the stress hormone. We're going to secrete a whole bunch of adrenaline, which we're probably not taking a run at that time. So it's just going to sit in our bodies, and it will exhaust us. And there's a physiological cost, because our bodies are going to get ready for fight or flight. Now, what's interesting is that we know if a tiger's coming in, I think this is very adaptive. Does anybody disagree with me? If you have a tiger, do you want to be able to run or fight or, or freeze? I do. But is it adaptive to be in this threat response all day at work? It's not adaptive. People don't work very well. And yet what we see in workplaces is quite often, depending on what kind of attitudes people have or maybe how tired they are or how they're doing in their work or how valued they feel, people stay in the threat response. So we'll have a chance to talk about this because of anthropology. We are built, guys. We are built to survive. So in the old days, survival, right, in the, our ancestors, survival was making sure that we had enough food, we had shelter, yes? That we were part of a big enough tribe so that if something happened, somebody could help us. That was all of our ancestors. But what's today? Today, we have something very different. Now, some people, unfortunately, still have survival threats where they don't have a place to live, where they don't have enough food. But most of us do. Most of us have a different threat today. We have psychological and social threats. We have a threat like this. I know you don't like what I'm talking about. She, she hasn't, what's your name? Amanda. Amanda has not, Amanda doesn't really like what I'm saying at all. Matter of fact, you know that she, she's looking at me really, I don't think she likes me. Amanda, don't you like me? She's not like me. <laughs> For some people, that could really kick off their threat response. I could lose my whole neocortex and not even remember what I'm supposed to say, Amanda. Thanks. <laughs> so we have social threats, especially at work. Especially at work. We have social threats sometimes with our supervisor. We have social threats that happen because maybe some coworkers don't like us. We have social threats when somebody ha has a birthday party and they decide only to invite five instead of the seven people that are in the office. Watch what happens. It's really fascinating. We'll talk more about it. Okay, I'm so <laughs> is she rushing me? Lisa, what is she's my friend, so it's okay. You see, it didn't kick off my threat response, but it could have. But I didn't know you, Lisa. So what do we get when there's organizational threat? Let's talk about the impacts. What we get is turnover. How many of you would agree that turnover is an issue in your counties? Turnover is an issue. We get turnover, we get a reduction in productivity and satisfaction, we get physical exhaustion because of the adrenaline, we get uh, problems with creativity and problem solving, we find that there tends to be organizationally increase in gossips and complaints, and what's interesting is there's also an increase in absenteeism, and also presenteeism. Does everybody know what presenteeism is? So presenteeism is this. It's where you are that work, and you're sitting in your seat all day, but you haven't been there in weeks. Do you know what I mean? But you show up, so you can't get, like, you don't get the time off, right? You're still working, supposedly. That's presenteeism. Um, workers' compensation, we see increases usually in, in claims. And what we also see eventually, and since I'm a professional threat assessor and I've worked a lot with um, actually violent situations in the workplace, is we also see sometimes an inc uh, increase in aggression, and sometimes it can lead, unfortunately, to an increase in, in, in violence potential. But we also have the reward response. Remember, we have that threatened reward. Let's talk about that, because this is much more positive, in my opinion. So here's what happens. If people in the workplace feel valued, if people in the workplace feel valued, they will feel rewarded. When they feel rewarded, it's like winning the lottery. 
you end up with this whole pleasure neurochemicals that start going off. You want to know what they are? They're dopamine. Dopamine is when you win the lottery, you get this big splash of dopamine. But when I say to you, Amanda, I want you to know that you did an amazing job on that project. Matter of fact, you did such an amazing job on that project, I would like you to train the other groups that are now going to work on that project. Would you be willing? Absolutely. Thank you. See, she likes me now. I just figured out how to do it, right? So I say that because we want to feel as human beings valued. We want to feel valued. We want to be acknowledged. Am I correct? Absolutely. Right. She's, she's, by the way, Amanda's my sister. No, I'm just joking. I don't know Amanda. So we also get something called oxytocin. So you guys know oxytocin. For those of you who may have ever held babies, you secrete oxytocin when we're holding babies. Now, for those of you who hate babies like my daughter does, I need you to know that there is also another way to secrete oxytocin. It is called the love hormone. That is dogs with dogs. Sorry, cat lovers, but it's with dogs. <laughs> so dogs also, we are finding in the research, you can secrete oxytocin. So all of this neurochemical stuff is going off, right? And we also get serotonin. And serotonin is actually a, a neurochemical that actually increases mood. It uplifts mood. And what else do we see? When we work in what we call rewarding rewarding environments, work environments, we also end up seeing workforces start to thrive and we start to see more organizational health. Why? All because of this little red spot on the brain called the reward activation center. It's really called the nucleus incumbens, but you don't need to know that. But this is literally, this little spot is the reward activation center. So let's take a look at some reward impacts. Reward impacts include this, optimizing em employee functioning. We start to see an increase in employee well-being. Oh, people don't leave, by the way, who work in places like this. Matter of fact, the research shows that people will take less money if they work in an environment where they feel like they belong and they're honored and valued. They will take less money, not unless it's like an extra 100,000. Okay, if somebody comes to you and says 100,000, you'll probably go and be unhappy, but you'll take it, right? But, uh, maximizes learning and development. People can actually learn. So if you look at your training and find out what kind of how you design your trainings, make sure that people don't feel um, punitive. They don't feel like it's a punishment to train. I once was trained in a process because um, I worked in a medical center. So they were tra training me in EMR. And then like I didn't know what I was doing the next day, I promise you. So I went to the person. They said, well, we trained you yesterday. And my response was, yes, but today it's all gone. I mean, <laughs> that was so yesterday. And then it created the threat response, and I promise you I didn't learn it for months after that. Um, complaints, grievances go down. We see, really, we see a, a real shift in terms of morale. And why? I'm going to go into detail about the scarf and help you a little bit in terms of understanding. What David Rock has done is, based on his research, he's created this scarf model. But I also want to invite each of you, when you're heading home or when you get home, or if you're going back to the hotel, to go on here and to do your own scarf. You can do a scarf assessment. It's free. It's a, it has amazing amounts of normative data, and it's very interesting in terms of, of assessing yourself and what some of your needs are. So let me, let me tell you. He found that the scarf model of social threats and rewards are three, five pieces. One is status. We want to make sure that we feel like we are important. Another one is certainty. In work environments where there is so much uncertainty, it creates threat. Autonomy, people like to have autonomy. Relatedness, people like to feel like they belong. And fairness, people like to be working in an environment where they feel it's fair. So let's move on here. I'll tell you the first one. Here's what status is. This is what status is, um, uh, how it's, how it's uh, uh, defined. Status is defined as a perception of one's own importance. It's not about position, and it's not about title. It's about contribution. It's not even about the hierarchy. It's about contribution. Now here's the problem though, is I go across and I will talk to so many people and I will ask them, so how does your job contribute to the whole of your department or maybe even the whole of your agency? And they look at me like I've got four heads. Like, I don't know. If people tell me they don't know their contribution, they're not experiencing the status that they need to be experiencing wherever they are in the organization. So what we find is that when we acknowledge value, people's strengths, people's expertise, when people are, when somebody comes to you and says, I want to develop you, what do you want to be in this organization and I want to help you get there? When people say, when, when management and supervisors aren't afraid and don't feel competitive, 
that one day you could take my job and I'm going to hope you can take my job because I will know I mentored you. By the way, one of my, I ran a doctoral training program for, for many years and one of them did. I left and they did take my job. I felt like a proud mama, guys. I trained this young man for years. So I say that because, but when we feel threatened by that, we will subtly keep people down and they will not, they will, we will subtly give the message that we are not supporting their growth. But we need, and our brains need, the opportunity to improve, learn, and grow. Intelligent people need to keep growing. I'm going to say it again. Intelligent people need to keep growing. If you have people in jobs where they're wanting more and they're asking for more and you're not able to provide it for them, you need to know they're going to get squirrely and they're probably looking at other jobs, for other jobs. They need to keep growing. So let's look at this. Let me ask you a question on this. In terms of organizational connectivity, when we look at status, we, start to, we need to understand, and leadership needs to understand the connectivity. So let me ask you a question. Which one of these watch pieces would we want to get rid of and expect the watch still work? And don't say the time, the time hands, because I know we could probably get rid of the hands, although won't, we wouldn't know what time it was, but any thoughts? Which one do we want to get rid of? Take a look. When we're looking at organizational connectivity, we start to understand that if a, anybody who's in a job has some value that is actually an asset, but they don't always know what it is. So we really don't want to probably get rid of anything in this watch piece because it would stop working. Same as jobs, and yet quite often we don't, we don't do the analysis that we need for people to understand their contributions. So let me go to the next one. The next one is certainty. Certainty is very interesting in HSAs because HSAs are kind of synonymous with uncertainty at times. So I say this because human beings, we as human beings prefer predictability and familiarity. That's just who we are. Why do we prefer that? Because if you're familiar to me, you're safe. If you are not familiar to me, I have to figure out whether you are safe or are you a threat. Remember, it's all anthropological. So. What happens, though, what we see organizationally is that when there is mild uncertainty, we actually see some excitement. People will kind of, okay, there's some mild uncertainty here. I think I'm going to work a little harder. But when we see excessive uncertainty, or what I call chronic uncertainty, what we see is people are in their threat response to such a degree that they are probably, their functioning decreases by 50 to 60% at least. In other words, we, we great talent cannot be great talent if you're sitting in your threat response a lot. Now, how do, what do you do in terms of offsetting this? When there's uncertainty, there are ways to offset it in terms of this. And a lot of that is what I tell leaders is stay really authentic and open. Many times, and I remember this when, when, when I was in, in management, many times I couldn't tell somebody really everything that was going on. But what I could tell them is that I couldn't tell you everything that's going on right now. But let me tell you what I can tell you. And I will tell you more when I, when I get permission to. Well, that's a real different message than just not saying anything when people kind of know, right? Remember, HSA professionals, they're picking up all the stressors. They know something's up, right? Because the part of the mirror neurons is that. There's a high level of perception. So I say this because we can still, we can still message clearly. We can still create work expectations that are clear. What we find in the research is that when people have work expectations that are really unclear and they work in that, I'm sorry, oh thank you, they work in that state, is that what ends up happening is that they will, they are literally their function will decrease significantly. We also know that if we align work with goals or we create projects into small steps so we have what we call small wins, you, six, you keep celebrating steps by steps, people feel valued. Autonomy is another interesting one, guys. Autonomy, what we find is that human beings have to, have to have choices. Now think about any work environments that you've ever worked in where you felt like you didn't have enough choices. Now there are some things that you can have a choice on. There are certain work deadlines, am I correct? There are certain things that we can't. But there are other things that we can. And what's interesting about autonomy is that it is, what the research showed is it wasn't the types that people needed certain types of autonomy. Like, I need to come in anytime I want, Lisa. Okay, so I'm probably going to come in at 5 and I'll leave at 6 tonight. Is that okay? Great. Great. I thank you. <laughs> That's why I want you to be my boss. So 
I say this because that's not necessarily realistic, but what it is, it's the perception of autonomy. Our brain needs the choices. So what does this mean? So what we see organizationally is some managers will give too much direction or they give too little. What is a sweet spot for direction? People ask me this all the time. The sweet spot for direction is what it is when you ask the question to your employees, how much direction do you need? And that becomes a sweet spot. You may, need, you may have a different sweet spot for everybody, and that's okay. Or you might want to know what your sweet spot is and ask for it. Some people need less, some people need more. Some people need less on one project and need a lot more on another. Um, allowing control. I tried in the 10 years that I was a senior manager here in HR in Davis, I tried my best never to say no to vacation time. I, I failed. I had to say no once. But I'll tell you why. Because everybody knew to check, to check Outlook. If everybody, if half people were out, don't ask me. Please don't ask me. Don't make me say no. And once somebody did ask me, and I was like, I put my head down, I'm like, really, didn't you look? And, and you know, she's like, I know I looked, but, um, and then I had to say no. But I say that because those are all autonomous things, creating, creating um, flex time if it's possible, creating people to go to trainings that they're interested in, not the ones that they necessarily have to go to, but also something that they might be interested in, to inform people rather than dictate. To create work teams, especially line staff work teams. We're seeing great, great changes in morale when line staff have work teams where they're given real, real problems in the organization and they come up with solutions. It's very exciting in the counties that I'm working across the country who are doing that. So here's the thing. So micromanaging, guys, is not autonomy. Now, here's the thing about micromanagers that fascinate me. Can I tell you? Micromanagers don't know they're micromanagers. I'm amazed. They don't know. They never know. I, I don't know many that have ever said, hi, I'm a, I am a, a self-identified self micromanager. Have you anybody ever met one? Hi, I micromanage in your name. So we know them, but they don't know that they are. So it's part of actually micromanaging is part of where people need education around their their response to, to other people. Let's talk about relatedness for a while. Fourth one is relatedness. Relatedness is trust and empathy for others. It's inclusion. We have a basic human need to be included. And what happens when we have these stro social, strong social connections, we actually get the oxytocin hit. Who doesn't want to be at work feeling love hormone going off all day long? I like it. But here's ways in which, and by the way, this PowerPoint will be available to you. Take a look at what happens. Part of what happens is we see is that when we build teams where people are clear about their goals or clear about their values, they're able to collaborate, be part of group activities. Food ends up to be an amazing, an amazing thing where people belong, when you can eat together. When people are allowed to go beyond their supervisor and talk to people across the, across the um, agencies, it allows people to feel like they really do belong to this agency that they're working in. And then, of course, we have fairness. Fairness is interesting because perceived unfairness, it's very perceived. People will perceive unfairness, and it equals threat immediately. So what happens? What we want to look at is, is making sure that we create clear expectations, but also that we are fair in how it is that we manage or how it is that people, our colleagues are with each other. We need to stay fair. It's something as coaches that is very important. When we start looking at this as a coaching model, it's very, very important in terms of being able to help, help our um, leaders and our, and our supervisors with these kinds of issues. So let me play a quick. So a final experiment that I want to mention to you is our fairness study. Uh, and so this, this became a very famous study, and there's now many more, because after we did this about 10 years ago, uh, it became uh, very well known. And we did that originally with capuchin monkeys. And I'm going to show you the first experiment that we did. It has now been done with dogs and with birds and with chimpanzees. Um, with, but with Sarah Brosnan, we started out with capuchin monkeys. So what we did is we put two capuchin monkeys side by side. Again, these animals, they live in a group. They know each other. We take them out of the group, put them in a test chamber. And there's a very simple task that they need to do. And if you give both of them cucumber, 
for the task, the two monkeys side by side, they're perfectly willing to do this 25 times in a row. So cucumber, even though it's really only water in my opinion, but cucumber <laughs> is perfectly fine for them. Now if you give the partner grapes, the, the food preferences of my capuchin monkeys correspond exactly with the prices in the supermarket. And so if you give them grapes, it's a far better food, uh, then you create inequity between them. So that's the experiment we did. Recently, we videotaped it with new monkeys who had never done the task, thinking that maybe they would have a stronger reaction, and that turned out to be right. The one on the left is the monkey who gets cucumber. The one on the right is the one who gets grapes. The one who gets cucumber, note that the first piece of cucumber is perfectly fine. The first piece she eats. Uh, then she sees the other one getting grape, and you will see what happens. So she gives a rock to us. That's the task. And we give her a piece of cucumber, and she eats it. The other one needs to give a rock to us. And that's what she does. And she gets a grape. And she eats it. The other one sees that. She gives a rock to us now, gets again cucumber. She tests the rock now against the wall. She needs to give it to us. And she gets cucumber again. There we go. So this is basically the Wall Street protest that you see here. So that is what we call the fret response, guys. The experience of unfairness, even with monkeys, with capuchin monkeys. So let's end with this. When we're looking at transform coaching for transformational change, what we're looking at is the ability to assess capability and willingness. Does someone we're working with actually have the capability and willingness to grow? Can we actually create some hardwire learning? Can we build? Can we build insight and behavior change? How are we going to do that? Can we help people change beliefs and address some of the triggers when they're getting triggered from one of these five of the SCARF model, what are their triggers? And can we help them with those? Can we help leaders understand what they're triggering and the way in which they're leading? And can we build in change as rewarding rather than a threat? Can we keep that in mind? In coaching strategies, we want to coach to reward the brain. And the SCARF is, is designed to build awareness. It's an awareness model. It's, it's, it's designed to build skills versus solutions. What kind of skills do we want to build so that people can, can, can actually take those skills and use them over and over again and generalize them to other situations? When we're looking at coaching, we want to be able to help people understand and manage their triggers because we know if people are in the threat response, they are not at their best. They are not at their best. So I'll, I'll apologize now, but I have a very, very learned very, very long for anybody who is interested in terms of being able to go deeper in this, in, this, uh, in, in this topic. I want to thank each of you for coming today and for being a part of this conference. I'm incredibly excited. I'm looking forward to next year. And I thank each of you, and I hope that you all have a safe trip home. Uh, please safe travels. <laughs>